All right, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, an introduction to return-oriented exploitation on 64. And um, I did actually already present this talk earlier today, um, but the audio didn't uh, record, unfortunately, so I'm doing this a second time. Um, so first of all, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Billy Ellis. I'm a 17-year-old from the UK, and I've been doing programming and iOS app development for around five or six years now. And uh, recently, in the last two years, I got interested in uh, security, uh, specifically mobile security, and software exploitation. And uh, during that time, I've uh, created a, various, uh, a set of various um, ARM exploit exercise binaries, which are they're basically like small programs where you can test your skills um, at different types of memory corruption and exploitation. Um, and those are available online. I'm also the author of Beginner's Guide to Exploitation ARM, which is what the title says. It's a beginner's, gu a beginner's guide to the basic concepts of software exploitation, uh, specifically geared towards the ARM architecture, so mobile devices. And I also run a YouTube channel teaching different program related topics, um, app development, exploit development, things like that, um, mostly re related towards um, iOS jailbreaking. So the focus of this talk is to introduce return-oriented exploitation techniques for people who are not familiar with it. Uh, also to cover the fundamentals of both the ARM and the ARM, v, uh, the ARM 64 architectures. And then I'm going to demo um, a ROP exploit at the end to kind of integrate some of the techniques I'm going to discuss into an example that you can uh, see. So first of all, why would you want to target um, ARM? So ARM devices are obviously mobile devices. These are all running on ARM-based chips. Some laptops now even use ARM as well and uh, embedded systems, smartwatches, lots of different devices are running on ARM-based chips. Um, so obviously it's making it a, a huge um, worthwhile target for attackers and malware developers because they're becoming more and more popular. And so there's a, there's a big market for that. Uh, so we're gonna look at the fundamentals, first of all, of the ARM v7 architecture. So this is the 32-bit um, ARM architecture. Um, it uses instructions of a fixed size of 32 bits and it also supports a different mode known as the thumb mode, which is a 16-bit mode. So uh, that's used for like, memory um, uh, efficiency. Uh, it also has 16 main registers that you need to know about as a, an assembly programmer. And these registers are labeled from um, R0 to R15. So R0 to R12, these are all general purpose registers. And uh, you can essentially use these to store any, uh, any data you need for your, for your programs. The first few of those, so I think R0 up until R3 maybe, those are used for passing arguments to functions. So you would pass your first argument in R0, second in R1, and so on. Then you also have some special purpose registers. So R13, first of all, this is used as a stack pointer register, which will always hold the address that points to the top of the current stack frame. R14 is the link register, which will hold um, an address where code execution needs to resume after a function has uh, returned to its caller. And finally, R15 is the program counter, which will store the uh, address of the next instruction to be executed. So on the other hand, we have ARM v8. This is the 64-bit version, so it's also referred to as um, ARM64. And uh, this, the ARM v8 chips uh, do actually support AOC32 for backwards compatibility. And uh, there's also some additional features in um, ARM64 processors, including the support for exception levels, which is a, a way of physically separating the execution le levels of code. So you can compare this to something like ring zero and ring one, that sort of thing, but uh, that's beyond the scope of this talk. Um, with the registers on v 8 we have a different set of registers. This time we have a lot more general purpose ones. We have 30, so and these are labeled from X0 to X29. And um, you also can actually refer to these in a 32-bit context if you use a W to reference them by. So um, the W actually obviously will, it will mean the same register, but it will refer to it as a 32-bit register, register instead. So it will essentially ignore the upper 32 bits. Um, and again, we have the same three uh, special purpose registers, the link register X30 this time, stack pointer X31. And then the program counter this time is its own register that's not actually directly modifiable um, by the programmer. So if you're writing some ARM64 uh, ARM assembly code, you cannot actually move a value directly into the program counter. Uh, you, you can only use the branch instructions, whereas on ARMv7, you can actually use R15 as, a, as a, re a register to manipulate just like you would with any others. So here's a couple of illustrations to demonstrate the differences between these two uh, instruction sets. So you can see there's the differences in the register names, both these small functions doing the same thing. Um, instruction mnemonics are going to vary very slightly. 
and then return instructions with arm v7, we have um, a branch to the link register instruction. Arm v8, you actually have um, a ret, which is, actually does the same thing. Uh, some differences with the stack access instructions. So with arm v7, we have a push, which is a kind of classic stack access uh, instruction that you know about, which will add items to the top of the stack. So in this case, specified by the registers. Um, on V8 is slightly different. You first of all actually manually um, shrink, or oh, sorry, grow the stack by subtracting a value from the stack pointer. So this gives the stack some new space at the top. And then you use an STP instruction. This will store a pair of registers. So in this case, X29 and X30 at the address relative to the stack pointer. So it's done in two stages instead of one. And then that same thing goes for the opposite. So removing items from the stack. And this also ties in with returning from functions. So Again, with v 7 we just have a pop instruction, which pops values from the stack into the registers. Um, and then, as I said, you can directly access the program counter in v 7 So this would actually be sufficient enough to re return from a function. You would have your return address on the stack, and you'd pop it directly off into the program counter to return back to where you were before. With v 8 this time we have three instructions. So we use an LDP to load a pair of registers um, from the stack. So in this case, we x29 and x30 again. Then we manually shrink the stack by adding a value to the stack pointer, so it shrinks it back to its original size. And then we return with the ret, which actually branches to x30, which we would have just loaded with the uh, the LDP. So that's the basics of the ARM architecture out of the way. Um, now we're going to talk about the basics of ROP, or Return Oriented Programming. So ROP stands for Return Oriented Programming, and it's a modern exploit technique used to execute a payload. Um, and it works uh, on the basis of a code reuse attack. So this was originally designed as an alternative to shellcode payloads, which uh, is the old-fashioned way of writing a payload, that you may know. Um, this basically involves writing the actual byte encoding for several instructions to somewhere in the memory that you control. So for example, on the stack or on the heap, an attacker could write their own instructions, and then they would just jump to this place in memory using their uh, code execution bug and then they would be able to execute whatever, whatever instructions they wanted to. Um, but obviously on modern systems, it's actually not possible anymore. But um, here's a diagram to kind of illustrate how that would have worked. So you can see we have a, a stack here, and uh, assuming this is vulnerable to a classic kind of stack buffer overflow vulnerability, uh, you can see we write uh, lots of shell code in the green there, uh, which is the actual instructions of byte representation. And we write that down until we get to the point of the save return address. And then we just overwrite the save return address with an address pointing back to the start of this shellcode um, buffer. And then when the function that you're currently in returns, it's going to jump to your shellcode and execute all the instructions you've prepared. So you can essentially execute arbitrary code on your on your target process. Um, but as I said, it's not long, it's no longer possible because we have basic forms of data execution prevention, um, which essentially means that the stack and heap memory you cannot execute anything from there because it's considered data. Uh, so you can only execute code that's in the actual text segment of the binary where the real instructions will be. So ROP obviously provides the workaround to that because it uses real instructions that are actually in the code segment, but it just uses them in a different order essentially. So it's kind of like piecing together uh, parts of the code in your own order. So you just take pieces from different functions, connect them together in an order that achieves an outcome you want, and that's how you construct the payload with ROP. So uh, you actually use gadgets, which um, are, these are short sequences of instructions that um, end with a return instruction. And this return instruction is the vital part that allows you to actually chain together several pieces of code to then execute a full chain, a full, a full chain payload. Now these gadgets are obviously found within the tech segment or the, the actual binary, uh, the, the executable segment. And they're normally found at the end of a function because obviously they end in the return and that's where you'd, that's where you'd uh, normally find them. So this is an example of one gadget you might find uh, for on the ARM64 architecture. Uh, you can see it consists of three instructions. The first one is an STR instruction. And this, in this case, it stores uh, the value of a register to a uh, memory location. So in this case, it stores whatever data is currently held inside of X0. And it'll store that where, wherever X1 points to. So for example, an attacker, if they can already control X0 and X1 beforehand, they have, using this gadget, an arbitrary write primitive because they can patch any area of the process memory by setting up these values beforehand and then jump into this gadget. So that's why you might use this. The next two instructions in the gadget are not actually really part of the gadget. They're just the return instruction. So on RMB8, on RMB you have the two, two instructions to return. So again, load in the pair of registers and then branch into X30. 
So, um, but this, this the STR instruction is the only real desired instruction from this gadget. So gadgets are obviously chained, as I mentioned, with the return instructions. And this works essentially by placing all the gadget addresses that you want to execute in a chronological order on the stack going downwards. And then every return instruction uh, is going to get the next address from the top of the stack because that's how returning normally works with functions. It will assume the address to return to will be on the stack. And therefore, it's going to essentially go through your whole payload, jump into these different locations in code. So this diagram kind of represents that. So again, if we have a stack with a buffer overflow vulnerability, this time we fill it up with some junk, not the shell code. So in the green, it's just some junk data. Then we get to um, the point of the save return address. And then this time we overwrite that with the address pointing to somewhere in the code segment. So you can see up there it points for the gray arrow, it points to some gadget. It doesn't matter what it is, but it points to some gadget. Then all of the other gadgets that we want to execute after that, we just place them continuously going down the stack in the chronological order. And uh, what happens is when the function returns, it's going to jump to your first gadget, which it obviously can execute because it's in the real code segment. That gadget is going to return, which is going to follow the blue line back down, go to your next gadget, and so on. This will keep going on depending on how many gadgets you've set up. And uh, that's how you execute a full payload. And uh, yeah, so the rect is what allows them to jump to the next gadget. So to actually find gadgets, uh, you obviously have to work with what you've got in the binary, so you need to be able to, you need to have an efficient way to be able to actually scan the binary. So there's a lot of tools out there that will allow you to search a binary for gadgets. Um, so essentially it works by scanning the whole binary for return instructions, first of all. And then when you find a return instruction, you just search backwards in four byte chunks to look at the instructions that come before it. And then obviously if you find an instruction before it that is useful to you in your specific case, then you can note down the address of that gadget and use that in your payload. And there's obviously a lot of tools that are online available that will do this for you. So there's a, there's a couple of examples there, which you want to check out. So um, when executing a complex ROP chain or a ROP chain involving a lot of gadgets, there's often um, a problem that you may run into um, because this, this is obviously a very common occurrence if you're working with a real world exploit. So for example, if you're targeting a kernel vulnerability, um, for example, in the iOS kernel and the Android kernel, often the goal would be to use that kernel kind of vulnerability to obtain code execution and then actually patch out security measures that allow you to use the device in a different way. Now, this is not going to be done with a single gadget. You're obviously going to need a lot of preparation, a lot of different patches being applied. And uh, in some cases, you may need several hundreds of gadgets to actually achieve the outcome. Now, there is a problem with that, um, which it will arise if you're working with modern bugs, um, particularly ones based around the heap. So. The majority of bugs um, found in modern systems today, at least what I've studied and what I've seen, are heap-related bugs. So, for example, heap overflows or more complicated ones such as use after freeze or double freeze. These are the ones that most people uh, are most commonly found in modern systems today. And obviously, a lot of these, that every, every vulnerability is different. So in a certain way it can occur, you may be limited to the amount of gadgets you can, you can actually execute. And this is because if you don't actually have access to the stack, like I just showed with the demo before, if you're not working with a stack buffer overflow vulnerability, then you have no full con you have no control over the data on the stack. So if you have your heap overflow, then you trigger your bug, jump to your first gadget. When that gadget tries to return, it's going to be returning to the stack because that's how that's done, and therefore you're not going to have any data on the stack that you control. So you can only execute one gadget uh, before the program just terminates. So the solution to this is using a technique known as stack pivoting which uh, is a technique that allows you to basically create your own fake stack with data that you fully control. And um, you do this by basically modifying the stack pointer register and making it point to a new location in memory. Uh, and then this memory gets populated with your ROP chain or your gadget addresses. And then you redirect code execution to your first gadget. And then when it returns, instead of going to the real stack, it's going to be using your fake stack, which has obviously got all the data you control. So it's going to go through your gadget chain just as normal as if you did have full control over the real stack. So I'm going to explain kind of how this works exactly. But first of all, uh, for those of you who want to know a bit more about the stack itself, uh, in most computer science um, classes, you'd be told that the stack is um, a last in first up data structure. And you essentially treat it as a physical stack of items. So you can add an item to the top by pushing it. Uh, and then you can remove an item from the top by popping it. So it's essentially like a stack of plates. You can always you can add one to the top and remove one from the top. But obviously, this is just a theoretical model of it. And um, the actual way this works uh, is a lot different in, in low-level memory in terms of how the binary would execute. 
The stack is just an area of memory, and the only thing that makes it the stack is the fact that the stack pointer points to it. So for example, this uh, is just a block of memory here, and you can see I've got the stack pointer up there set to uh, address one zero, and that red arrow represents that. So this is currently considered as the top of the stack, and uh, it's only considered that because of the pointer, the stack pointer value. So you can see the data on the stack, it's 414141 is the top item. So if you wanted to remove this item from the stack, you would execute a, a pop instruction. And uh, the way this actually executes in the low level is all that's happening is your stack pointer value is being incremented by four for every value you want to pop. So you increment it by four, the stack pointer now points to somewhere higher in memory, but lower down the stack because the stack grows in the opposite way to, me, to what you may think. It grows towards the lower addresses. And therefore, now your stack is one item shorter. No data has actually changed in terms of the memory, but your pointer is pointing one higher in memory. So this is considered the new top of the stack. And uh, you can see the data actually remains in the memory because it doesn't, doesn't really matter if it's there or not. It's no longer considered part of the stack. And um, same thing goes for pushing. So in, in this case, it's the opposite. So you would decrement the stack pointer to grow it. So uh, up to here, and then you write your new data to this new location. Um, yeah, and then your new item has been added to the top of the stack. So with this knowledge, you can uh, now see how a stack pivot would work. So let's assume this is the whole process memory for a target program. And um, down here, this section here is reserved for the stack. So you have the stack base, and then everything in between is the stack, and then the stack pointer, which is the top of the stack. Now, if you have some other block of memory somewhere else, which you control, so if you're working with a heap-related uh, heap bug, let's say we have a heap memory here with um, our fake ROP stack in. So we fully control this memory. We lay, we lay this out with our gadget addresses. And um, all we need to do to actually achieve the stack pivot is to somehow move this, the stack pointer so it points to the start of this heap memory. So when it points here, the program's not going to know any different. It just treats the stack as whatever this pointer points to. And therefore, this whole block is essentially going to be treated as a stack. So what that means is when you then go to execute your gadgets and they return, they're going to be returning from gadget addresses that have been placed in your controlled memory as opposed to what the real stack was. And uh, that's how you get your fake stack working. Um, so how, do you, how would you actually do this in practice? Well, you would use a special type of uh, ROP gadget known as a pivot gadget, which its sole purpose is to control the stack pointer value with uh, something that you can, you can uh, have some control over. So here's an example of one. Um, again, a simple gadget consisting of only three instructions. The first instruction this time is a move instruction, which will move x5, the value of x5, into the stack pointer. So assuming that the attacker already has their controlled address held in x5, this gadget would be perfect because they can then move that to the stack pointer and um, now the stack pointer points to their control memory. And again, the last two instructions are not actually really part of the gadget, they're just for the returning part. So using those uh, couple of techniques I've just covered, I'm going to show you an example attack on a, on a kind of demo program that I built for this talk. So the demo program, the target name is uh, B-Sides Demo, and this is a small, uh, simple artificial binary for the purpose of testing this out. Now there's an v 7 and an v 8 version. Uh, both of them I'm going to upload somewhere after this talk if you want to actually try this out yourself. Um, and the description there, you can see it says a small binary vulnerable to a heap buffer overflow. So obviously we're working with the heap again, so we are going to need a stack pivot. And uh, it allows a function pointer to be overwritten. So we're going to take a look at this binary. Uh, well, first of all, the aim for the exploit, we're going to we're going to attempt to call the secret function. Now the secret function is a function inside this binary that is never called in the actual normal execution flow. So it's kind of a hidden unused function. And um, we're going to call that function and pass a code to the uh, as the first parameter to this function. And then we're going to get some kind of success message saying that we successfully exploited the binary. So here's a screenshot of what the binary looks like when you execute it. So you can see that it gives you a B-sides banner at the top, and then it asks you to enter the path to a file containing some data. And uh, you enter whatever you want there, so file.txt. It's going to read in all the data from the file, and then just print out data is valid, um, and then that's when it will quit. So by now you probably already guessed, the only place um, the heap overflow can occur is when it actually reads the data out of the file, which is right, because this is a, a snippet taken from Hopper Disassembler, some pseudocode on the actual vulnerable part. So you can see this call to fread. This is actually reading in 512 bytes from, from whatever file the user specifies. And it's storing it into a 64-byte 
um, char array. So obviously there's, there's a blatant buffer overflow there. It cannot store that data in it, so it's going to overflow into adjacent memory. And conveniently for us, there is a function pointer directly next to this buffer. So any extra data other than the 64 bytes, this is going to be directly written in over to this function pointer, which again, conveniently, is actually called directly after this call to F3. So it's a very artificial um, uh, case because obviously a, a real world vulnerability would not be as simplistic as this, but this will uh, this just serves well for the demo purpose. Um, and that is the that's the offset from this um, structure, which will actually be on the heap. So 64 bytes along will be after that buffer, and it will call that function pointer. So the secret function, this is the one I said uh, is hidden, it's not actually used in a real uh, program, uh, but essentially it's a function that will take in a code as the first parameter, uh, and then it will compare that, so the code in this case is 414F, and it's going to compare that code to uh, your, your first argument, or W0, and uh, if, the, if the code is correct, then it's going to jump you to this section here, which will give you a kind of success message and say you've completed the exploit challenge. If the code is incorrect, or if you don't actually put a code at all, or supply code, it's going to jump you here, which will just give you an error message. Um, so you may be thinking, why would you not just jump directly to this place? Because that would obviously bypass this check and you'd get the, error, you'd get the success message straight away. But um, that would be too easy, and for the demonstration purposes, we're going to assume that we have to call secret um, from its entry point just so we actually do have to work with a real life, uh, a real rock chain that consists of a few more gadgets because otherwise it would literally be as simple as uh, replacing the function pointer address with that address of the secret part. So the exploit plan is going to be to obviously gain code execution, which we already know how to do that with the blatant overflow into the function pointer. Then we're going to use that to use the rock chain, which is going to first of all set up x0 or w0, hope to make sure it holds the secret code. And then it's going to just jump to the secret entry point, which should then validate that code and give us the success message. So what do we know already? Well, we can obviously control the program counter or the execution flow by overwriting that pointer. And since we're working with the heap, we can execute a single gadget worth of execution. So we're going to need the stack pivot so that we can actually execute several more gadgets after that. And this criteria for the stack pivot, again, must be a single gadget because that's all we get to work with. And it must allow us to point the stack, uh, stack pointer to this very start of the heap buffer because this is where the data from the file is going to go into. So obviously we control this memory and that's what we want as our fake stack. So this gadget is actually within the binary, the one I just uh, gave as an example as a stack pivot gadget. So it moves again uh, x5 into the stack pointer and conveniently for us again, um, I, I programmed this uh, example app uh, in such a way that X5 will happen to hold the address of our, uh, our heap chunk anyway. So again, very artificial because uh, it wouldn't be as easy as this to find a stack pivot in a real situation, but again, it serves well for this demonstration purpose. So we've got the stack pivot sorted out. Now for loading X1 or X0 or W0. So here are two gadgets we're going to use to do this. Now, you could theoretically do this with one gadget, but I wanted to kind of replicate um, the more real world idea of ROP because you uh, often when working with ROP, obviously you have to work with what you've got in your target binary. So you cannot create instructions. So often it will be the case that you find a gadget that sort of, it does kind of what you need it to do, but there may be side effects or it may be not as straightforward. So in this case, we want to control X0, but we have to do it in two stages because this first gadget, this lets us control X3 and X4 by loading a pair of registers, it loads them from the stack. So if we can have controlled data on the stack, which we already know we can do, we can control both of these registers. Now the next gadget will then allow us to move X4, which we just controlled into X0. So we kind of have to take two steps uh, to do this. And, uh, and at that point we will have full control over X0. <coughs> um, so that's uh, how we're gonna load the uh, X0 with the, with the code. And finally, to call secret, we literally just need the address of the secret function, which you can just find by disassembling the binary. So we've also got that done. So I've actually built um, an exploit file before I came here. Um, this, this file here successfully exploits the binary and does uh, carries out all of that rock that I just explained. And I'm gonna briefly uh, dissect what each part of this does again, just to make it clear um, how this payload works. So um, this is just the hex dump of the file exploit payload. And all of this data, this is less than 512 bytes, so all of this data is going to be written to the heap. And the first 64 bytes of it, so up until this point here, this is going to fill up the 64-byte char array that we had uh, on the heap. And that means that any data after that is going to be what goes into the, what overwrites the function pointer. So the first thing we have after that 
is this, which is the address of the first gadget. So essentially we have, we fill out the buffer, we overwrite the function pointer with the address of our first gadget, which is our pivot gadget, you can see there. And therefore when the function returns, it's gonna be doing the stack pivot straight away. So this will move x5 into the stack pointer, which once that's actually done, that essentially means the stack points to the top of this file. Uh, all the data in this file will all be on the heap. So when the stack pivot's done, uh, the stack pointer is gonna be pointing to the top of this. So therefore this is our new stack. And then obviously it returns by loading a pair of registers. It loads x29 and x30, and then it branches to uh, x30. So on the top of the stack, what we have is some junk data that's gonna be loaded into x29 because we don't actually care about that register. Then we have the uh, address that will go into x30, which we then jump to afterwards. So this is gonna be the address of the second gadget. And uh, this is the first stage in control in x0. So you can see this one is the one that loads x3 and x4. Again, from addresses relative to the stack. So we load some random data into x3, because we don't care about that one. And then we load the secret code into x4, which is the, the 414F. And this is all in um, little endians, that's why the uh, bytes are in reverse order, if you were wondering. Then we return from this gadget, so again, we load some junk into x29, and then we load the next address we want to go to, into x30. And this points to the third gadget, which will move x4 to x0. And uh, again, returns again, so we have junk in x29. And finally, the last thing we need to do is just jump to the secret um, entry point, which is what that address is there. So that will jump straight into secret. And uh, if all has been set up correctly, then at that point, we should already have the controlled code inside of X0. And so secret should validate that and give us the success message. So here we can specify that exploit payload file. Um, and then when we run this and enter that into the program, instead of it just reading out the data and saying that's all, this time it takes full control, executes the ROP chain, and then we have this uh, success, uh, success message saying that we managed to successfully crack the binary. And then it executes a uname-a command. Um, so that is the exploit complete. So it's just a quick demonstration of uh, the ROP technique and the stack pivot technique. Uh, if you want to learn more about um, ARM specifically or any other memory corruption exploitation, then there's a few useful links here. Uh, the top one is especially good for learning about just assembly programming on, on the ARM architectures. Um, and there's a few other ones that you can check out. And that second from bottom one, that's where you can download the exploit challenges that I've written for um, ARM-based devices. So if you want to try out some of those yourself. And um, yeah, that's my Twitter handle if you want to uh, tweet me or follow, follow, follow any of my work. And um, yeah, that's basically it. So if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer. If not, then you can tweet me afterwards and uh, or come up to me afterwards. Yeah, thanks. I've got a quick question. Um, yep. Is there, is there any safe practice that you could recommend to prevent people from finding rock chains in your code? Is there like a, a standard way of safely returning without making it vulnerable? Yeah, so there are actually some um, some methods, some mitigations against ROP. Um, I've not personally looked into them very much, so I, I can't really answer that question in too much detail, but even with those mitigations, there's actually another form of ROP known as JOP, or jump-oriented programming, uh, which uses a kind of a similar approach with obviously reusing code, um, but it uses a, a dispatcher gadget, and instead of using functions, or instead of using gadgets that end with a return instruction, it uses gadgets that end with conditional branches to other registers. So it's a lot harder to mitigate that. Um, but yeah, there, there are mitigations against ROP. I've, I've not seen very effective uses of them in, in major systems, so I'm not really sure, um, I'm not really sure too much about them, but um, yeah. Thank you. Any, any other questions? No. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you.